This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, back in Chapter 22, we got to introduce to the concept of groups within our area of study of corporate tax. There it was, we defined, for taxation purposes anyway, two types of group. They were 51% groups and 75% groups. Depending upon that share ownership that the parent company had within the subsidiary company, various things either had to be done or could be done. There were claims and elections. Clearly claims and elections only being done if it was advantageous for the group of companies in its entirety. We saw there, for example, that in the particularly interesting area of 75% groups, we could have group relief of losses made by one group member and we were able to group relieve any part of that loss against any part of another company's uh, 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 TTP, their taxable total profit there. We had flexibility. It was our choice. It was our decision. We could make that claim or not make that claim. There were also rules that applied. Again, in one of the more interesting 75% gains group areas there. And that was if you transferred an asset from one business to another, one group uh, member to another, that 75% gains group member there, then you'd have a choice on how it would be done. It would be a no gain, no loss basis. And that meant it would transfer at the transferor's cost and then plus indexation allowance. So we had rules that said, if you choose to do this certain something in a group, you do it our way, the HMRC way. But if, say, losses are sustained by one of your group members, then you have the ability to choose to use that loss in any other suitable and defined effective 75% group member. You can claim as much or as little. There was flexibility. We, as we've said, only make claims or elections where they are beneficial. What we saw back in the area of 51% groups was one of those areas which was known as group VAT registration. We didn't deal with it then because we had to deal with it here in Chapter 25 once you knew a little bit more about VAT. So what is this? Well, the concept is a pretty simple one, group VAT registration. What we've seen so far in this particular chapter is that a business, now that could be an unincorporated trader or a company, of course, but a business there either could choose to register if it made taxable surprise or had to register if it met the compulsory registration limits there. And once it was registered for VAT, then it would have to submit VAT returns accounting for the output VAT less any input VAT upon that VAT return. And normally it would work that way, that output VAT would exceed input VAT. And on that basis, therefore, the company, the business would pay over to HMRC. Well, now, if you've got a group of companies, this group defined as being a 51% group, you don't have to have 75%. It's only a 51% shareholding that is required between the parent and the subsidiary company. Then those companies, if they choose, can enter into a group VAT registration. So in essence, it's very simple. If they choose to do so, then only one VAT return will need to be submitted rather than each company submitting their own VAT returns. Let's look at some of these points now in the notes in front of you. We've got two or more companies indeed. Let's make sure the pen works. Two or more companies. There we go. Can register as a group for VAT purposes. They must be under common control of a third company and resident in the UK. We must have a permanent, a fixed establishment in the UK to join in a group VAT registration. In relation to that, therefore, we could see that we might have this situation, parent company, A Limited, and unsurprisingly here for our examples, three subsidiary, well, three shares, uh, uh, three companies in which we own shares named V, F and C Limited there. But then we look at the shareholdings. A controls V Limited and also controls F Limited. It does not control C Limited there. Now, whether that control is 
as with V, or 60% as with F, does not matter for purposes of group VAT registration. So what you have here is excluding company C, because we don't have control, we only own 40%. We have A limited controlling both V limited and F limited. And what that means is that all of those companies or two of those and any two of those companies could enter into a group VAT registration. Now then, in relation to that, as we have seen, just because we have the parent company and the two subsidiary companies there eligible for the group VAT registration doesn't compel group VAT registration. And if you want group VAT registration, you can choose which companies enter into that group VAT registration. If you want just the two subsidiary companies and not the parent company, fine. If you want the parent and one or other of the two subsidiaries, fine. And we'll talk why it is that you might choose here to leave out one of the companies eligible for group VAT registration, why you might choose to leave it out of the group VAT registration. If you're going to choose to do something, got to be a reason for it. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So there, A, V and F are all entitled to enter into a group VAT registration. The A limited group will decide which of those companies, if any, to put into that group VAT registration. And then one VAT return will be submitted for those group VAT registration members. And that doesn't have to be the parent company. The group will nominate the so-called representative member, the company to represent the group or the members of the group within that group VAT registration with HMRC. So returning to our notes, therefore, Two or more companies can indeed register as a group for VAT purposes. They must be under common control of a third company and resident in the UK. Now, that's what we've seen in terms of the usual group stuff we're dealing with companies. In point of fact, if you had a situation here where it wasn't A limited, but it was A, an individual or even say a partnership, then although A, not uh, again, necessarily a trader registered for VAT. But V limited and F limited would be under common control of A, the individual or A, the partnership, in which case V limited and F limited would still be eligible for a group VAT registration. They are under common control. Once we have defined who is eligible, el eligible? eligible and chosen which of those eligible companies or the companies indeed that we would like to be within the group VAT registration, then for those companies, the group is treated for VAT purposes as if it were a single company registered VAT on its own. So what does that mean? It means, as we've said, only one VAT return is submitted for the group. That therefore, presumably, is a, an administrative advantage. If we've got several members of the group, instead of each of those members doing each of their own individual returns, it could all be done in one VAT return. No VAT also will be accounted for on transactions between group members within the VAT group. An intra-group transaction is said to be outside the scope of VAT. Now remember again, it's important to define what we mean when there is no VAT that is charged upon a supply. Is it as it is here? It's outside the scope of VAT? Or is it zero rated? Or is it an exempt supply? This isn't a supply for VAT purposes. It is outside the scope. No VAT to charge on the sale. No VAT to look to recover on the purchase. Goods can be transferred without reference to the VAT system. As we've already said, the group can choose which companies to include or exclude. That's down to us to make that decision. In terms of who submits the group VAT return, the representative member of the group is appointed and it's that company that is responsible for completing and submitting what is a single VAT return and paying the VAT on behalf of the group. That said, though, it is the one that submits the VAT return and makes the payments. It is the case that all companies in the VAT group 
are jointly and severally liable for any VAT liabilities of the group. So the VAT could not build up a large amount of unpaid VAT in the representative member such that it was then insolvent and liquidated, saying to HMRC, oh, sorry, guys, uh, this particular company, which just happens to be the representative member, hasn't got any income, hasn't got any money. It's therefore going to be liquidated. Sorry, bye. No, it ain't going to work. HMRC will say, no, no problem. All of your other companies within that group, that registration, they're all jointly and severally liable. So if the representative member can't pay, then we'll go to other companies within that group. They are all liable there. Now, we said about we could choose whether or not to include or exclude the eligible companies, those within a 51% group membership there, those that are under common control, more than 50% shareholding. And we'd think that it would be a good thing to have them in there, getting those benefits of, so we don't now have to submit individual VAT returns. Intra-group transactions are outside the scope of VAT. Seems like a good idea. So why is it that we might choose deliberately to exclude one of the companies from that group VAT registration? Well, as it says here, it would be beneficial to exclude a company making zero rated sales. Now, remember, if a company makes zero rated sales, that means it is making taxable supplies, but no VAT, no output VAT is chargeable. But if it is incurring standard rated costs and expenses, well, what that means is there is input VAT. So if for any VAT return period, there is no output tax, but there is input VAT, what does it mean? It means, therefore, that HMRC pay you. You get money back from HMRC. And that begs the question of, well, how often would you like to get that back? And you'd like to get it back monthly rather than the usual quarterly. So on that basis, you may choose to submit monthly returns. Why would you choose to have that extra administration? Because you get cash coming into your bank account every month rather than waiting until the end of the quarter before you get that repayment from HMRC. So you may well consider, and certainly would, if the numbers, the amount of uh, repayment from HMRC was considerable for such a company, that if it made those zero rated supplies but had standard rated inputs, then let it continue on a monthly return basis so we get repayments from HMRC every month, while all the other companies in the group, oh, those that we choose to be in it, we will submit a group VAT return on a quarterly basis, so we'll pay them quarterly. Good idea. We get money from HMRC every month. We only pay amounts to HMRC every quarter. That's got a cash flow advantage. By the time we get to the end of the quarter, of course, then the same amount overall will have been net paid to HMRC. But in between times, we've got that money flowing in each month. That would seem to be a good idea. And that's the point made here. We would then be able to continue making monthly returns to get the improved cash flow of monthly VAT repayments, therefore. It isn't all plain sailing. It isn't always one way of being, this is a good idea, let's do it. And therefore, there are some disadvantages of group VAT registration. They are that the limits for both cash and annual accounting schemes that we saw earlier will apply to the group as a whole and not on an individual company basis. As we've already said, joint and several liability of each company in the group will exist. So if the representative member can't pay, the other members of that group, that registration, are liable. And also that we've said administratively, there's now only one VAT return to submit rather than however many companies are in the group. You've still got to get all that information from each of those companies into the representative member so it can submit its own VAT return for all members of the group VAT registration. So possible admin issues collecting the information 
that is then to be passed on to the representative member. So there we go, an option available when dealing with, usually within a group as we would know it, where at the apex, the holding entity who owns the shares in those companies is indeed a parent company there. That leaves just one further area to look at here, and that is UK businesses trading within and outside the European Union. Now, again, you may live a very long way away from the UK and away from the EU, but you may have heard that there may be a few places left within the world that haven't heard of that dreaded term Brexit there. And you will be therefore aware that the UK is no longer a member of the EU. However, what the examiner has said for this round of examinations, we will treat the UK as being still that fully fledged member of the EU and therefore the rules that preceded Brexit will continue for the exams that we've now got from June 21 through to March 22. So we can disregard the reality of what has happened and of course the transitional arrangements in between. They don't like to get involved in transitional arrangements, do the examiners, and wisely so. So although it is, as it were, a thing of the past, what we're looking at, this is still what you need to know for your exams, June 21 to March 22 inclusive. Right, as well we would know, UK businesses frequently trade with companies or individuals with other, within other, assuming we are still there, EU countries and also with non-EU countries there. The VAT treatment of exports and imports, I've used that term there, exports were selling to an overseas country, either within that overseas country, another business, or indeed it may be a personal customer, an individual rather than a business. What we'll discover is that when those exports, and equally imports if we buy in, where those transactions are to and from the EU, other EU members, then we have different names for what we would other know, otherwise known as exports and imports. The VAT treatment of exports and imports must be appreciated on these transactions. We look firstly at what is the main area, but not the only area, in terms of what we need to know, and that is the supply of goods. Let's look firstly at a UK business trading with non-EU countries. Sales made to such customers in an overseas non-EU country are exports and the supply of goods is zero rated. And now it doesn't matter whether or not the customer to whom we sell is itself a business or is simply an individual. It doesn't matter. Sales to non-EU countries, whoever the customer may be, these are zero rated. Compare that with trading with other EU countries where the exports are known as dispatches. These are called dispatches. And as we will be dealing with, when a UK VAT registered business supplies goods again dealing with the supply of goods here, to another VAT, re reg VAT registered business within the EU, then the supply is also zero rated there. But if the customer does not have a VAT registration, then either it's a very small business and therefore is not required to register for VAT, or the customer is themselves, they are themselves an individual but of course not then registered for VAT. So if our customer is not that registered, the UK supplier will charge UK VAT at the rate in force at the time of the supply. And if as would be usual, that supply would have been a standard rated supply, then it will be a standard rated supply. So when it comes to sales to non-EU countries, it doesn't matter who the customer is, all supplies are zero rated. But if that supply is to an EU country, then it does matter. If it's to another VAT registered business, then it too 
will be zero rated. But if it's to a non-VAT registered entity, business or an individual, there, then it's going to be standard rated. If that is what it would have been within the UK, a standard rated supply, then it will still be a standard rated supply. An output tax must be charged by that UK business on that sale. What about buying in from overseas countries? Starting with, again, the non-EU countries. The importation of goods, and again, these purchases are indeed known as imports, involves UK VAT being paid directly to HMRC at the point of entry into the UK. So as soon as those goods come into the country, be that at the port when they're uh, again offloaded from the ship or at the airport from the plane there, the importation of goods involves UK VAT pay directly to HMRC at the point of entry into UK. Now that therefore means that we have to pay before we can get our hands on those goods sitting in that dock having just come off the ship, we have to pay the VAT in relation to that purchase. Now what we discover is that regular importers can in fact defer this payment under the duty deferment scheme if the UK business provides HMRC with a bank guarantee. So it can be done on a regular basis and that uh, VAT on the import is usually accounted for on a monthly basis there in that situation. But otherwise, in order for those goods to be released from the docks, for you to be able to take them to your business, then you're going to have to account, you're going to have to pay for that VAT. What that means is that you've suffered VAT in relation to that supply. This is treated then as normal input VAT. So you are buying goods in, you are therefore having to account for the VAT on that purchase. And that means that it will therefore be treated as normal input VAT. So on that basis, as long as what you do is to make taxable supplies, you will indeed then be able to recover what you have paid to HMRC at that point of entry. You'll be able to recover it as normal input VAT in relation to your VAT return. So there's a slight cash flow disadvantage there. You have to part with the money to get the goods out, but that then becomes input VAT in relation to your VAT return, just like on any other purchase. If we're trading with EU countries, then the import is known as an acquisition. Remember, with trading within the EU, as we presume the UK is still a member of for this purpose, then we don't have exports, we have there, as we've seen, dispatches. We don't have imports, we have acquisitions. That's the jargon that we use here. And this is, again, probably the trickiest bit to get your head around, but it's actually good news so far as the UK business is concerned in terms of having to account for VAT on any transaction as regards a purchase. The VAT registered EU supplier will zero rate the transaction. We've just seen that exports between, again, from one uh, that registered business in one EU country to another, those are zero rated. So the VAT registered EU supplier selling those goods to us, for them, it will be zero rated. And the UK VAT registered business will as the term is used here, you don't have to worry about knowing it, but it's known as self-supply under what is called the reverse charge system. Now, don't lose sleep over those names. I'm only mentioning them if you see that within a question being used, so you identify what they're talking about. And we will self-supply under the reverse charge system for VAT on the VAT return. What does that mean? Self-supply effectively means that the UK VAT registered business, the one of, again there buying these goods in on what was effectively a zero rated sale to us, will calculate UK VAT 
on the acquisition and then we'll declare that as output that on the that return. This that can then be reclaimed as input VAT and that is means that the VAT contrasts out the input and the output VAT match and on that basis therefore there's no VAT cost. So what happens to repeat it means that when we buy in we'll calculate the UK VAT on the acquisition and we will declare it as output VAT on our VAT return. But we can then also declare it as being input VAT on the same VAT return. Just as we would do with a normal purchase in terms of buying goods that were standard rated to us, we account for the uh, uh, the output VAT charge becomes our input VAT. When we then sell on, we charge output that. We can put one against the other. What happens here? Although the sale made by the other EU business to us, the uh, UK business, although that was zero rated, when we buy in as a UK business, we have to account for VAT at our own standard rate of 20% on that particular purchase, but treat that VAT figure as being both input VAT in relation to the purchase and output VAT in relation to a self-supply. Now you might think, why go to the trouble of doing that? Because if we still left it as zero rated, then there'd be no VAT on the sale to us on our purchase, and we wouldn't be at any VAT cost anyway. So why do this? Why make us account for output VAT and also classify that as input VAT? In most situations, as we've said, the VAT contras out. The output, the input are the same. There's no net cost involved to the UK business. The only time there would be a VAT cost is if the business makes some exempt supplies as the exempt part of the business cannot reclaim input VAT. So if we suffer input VAT, which this system effectively means that we do, but then we make exempt supplies, then you can't recover any amount of input that that is in relation to an exempt supply. Now that's very unlikely, hugely unlikely, I'd suggest in terms of our syllabus. But if we got a narrative exercise to complete in relation to this issue, then that is the only situation where the use of this reverse charge, this self-supply system, would indeed incur a VAT cost so far as the UK business is concerned. Because it would have to account for input VAT, but it would not be able to recover any of that input VAT because the eventual sale of those goods that we bought in would be an exempt supply and you can't recover, as you know from day one in terms of our uh, study of VAT, that input tax attributable to an exempt supply cannot be recovered. But basically, this self-supply system will mean as long as you don't make exempt supplies, it means you don't have to account for VAT at that port of entry, at that airport, you don't have to pay over any amount. You simply have this self-supply, this reverse charge system, whereby you can put on the VAT return in which the purchase has been made, you can put the VAT onto your VAT return as both input VAT in relation to the purchase and the self-supply as in relation to a supply of goods made by you. It is both input and output. They contra out. It makes no difference. HMRC makers do that because it is the case that if a company, as we said, did make the UK business made exempt supplies, that means that any and all input tax attributable to that supply is irrecoverable. So if we just ignored it, if we said it was outside the scope of VAT, if it was just zero rated and we didn't have to account for any input VAT, then HMRC would be worse off. 
So they have that there. They make us do it this way. For most businesses, we don't have to pay anything out. We simply record on the VAT return. In the VAT return period in which we've made that purchase, we record VAT at the standard rate as both input VAT and output VAT. Net effect, nil, so far as the VAT return is concerned. And as compared to buying in from outside the EU in that situation, we were able not to have to pay over at the port of entry any amount of VAT in relation to that purchase. So again, it sounds a bit messy, but actually in practice it's very simple and it's effective and it helps businesses, except of course those that would go on to make exempt supplies and therefore cannot recover the input VAT. Okay, so let's put that theory into practice now by looking over the page at example eight here. So what have we got? We've got to here discuss, did I say we? You are going to have to discuss the VAT implications of the above transactions and all transactions are stated exclusive of VAT. So we'll have to charge 20% where applicable the standard rate on that figure rather than being that inclusive. They'll always be given here exclusive of VAT. So what have we got? We've got BW Limited, a UK VAT registered UK business, and it's making acquisitions purchases here. Where's the first purchase? We're acquiring £12,000 of goods from its suppliers in the United States of America. Clearly, therefore, non-EU. And £20,000 of goods from its supplier in Germany, which is within the EU. In what is the quarter to the 31st of March 2021. So we're buying in here goods from both outside and from inside the EU. In the same VAT quarter, BW Limited makes sales of £50,000 to a VAT registered customer in France. France obviously within the EU and it is a VAT registered customer. And £10,000 of goods to a non-VAT registered individual in Latvia, which is also within the EU. Now you see, you see both of those sales are made to customers within the EU. I'm not giving you an example of sales made to a customer outside the EU. If I had, then it's very easy because all sales or exports made to non-EU customers outside the EU, that means whether they are businesses or whether they are individuals, it doesn't matter. All of those sales would be zero rated. We only have a difference in terms of any possible VAT to charge in relation to one of the types of supply that you see here made to an EU customer. Now the two EU customers you have, the two possibilities you can see, they of course are to a VAT registered customer in France, that therefore therefore another EU business it is to a business consumer of that registered business, whereas this one to Latvia is non that registered individual. Now, as we know, one of those is zero rated and one of them isn't. You have to try and remember or at least look back at your notes to find out which of those it is. And that should be a simple exercise. So there will be output VAT to uh, account for in relation to one of those sales, but not the other. The more interesting situation is when we deal with our purchases. And we're told, as we have seen here, that we acquire 12,000 pounds of goods from its suppliers in the United States of America, non-EU. So we're buying at a VAT exclusive, as it would be figure of 12,000 pounds from an American supplier outside the EU. So where we buy in from outside the EU, in order for us at the airport or the port, however they have been shipped in to us, for us to get our hands on those goods, then at that point of entry, we have to pay the VAT, subject to the duty deferment scheme, allowing us to do it on a more regular basis, given a period of credit there. But otherwise, we have to pay in order to acquire those goods 
to be able to put them on our lorry and take them back to our business. In relation to the supply there from the Germany, the EU business, then of course there is no cash that will change hands. That those goods coming in from Germany will be able to pass through the point of entry, the port of entry, the airport of entry, wherever it might be, without having to account for any VAT in relation to that particular purchase. In relation to that, what then happens as regards we've made that purchase, we don't have to pay anything at the point of entry. There's no cash that needs to be laid out here, but we do need to account for VAT on the VAT return for the period in which that uh, import, that sorry, that purchase was made, that acquisition was made. So you've got to here sort out what happens in relation to the sales. One is standard, sorry, one is zero rated and one is standard rated. And what happens in relation to the purchases where we are going to have to account for VAT to pay VAT in relation to both of those transactions. One is an actual payment at the port of entry and the other is no such payment, but we need to account for the VAT on our VAT return. And when we account for it, it was that reverse charge system. So that wasn't a single entry onto our VAT return. It's two entries onto our VAT return at both input and output VAT, which should therefore contra one another out. But it can't be ignored. That has to go on the VAT return. OK, I've given you sufficient clues, therefore. If you now uh, just pause at this particular point in time, write out your answers. You can do it briefly, but don't just read the answers. Write it out or at least test yourself on it. Don't just read the answer or wait for me to talk you to that answer. You do it for yourself there. Test yourself out on every occasion. So pause now and then I'll talk you through that. So let's see what we've got there for in relation to those transactions. Firstly, in relation to the uh, disposals that have been made there. Again, let's make sure that the pen works. We have got well, what I've referred to as the export here of £50,000 of goods to the VAT registered customer in France will be zero rated. We know, of course, that these are known rather than as exports as dispatches, but export in a more general term of making a sale to an overseas country. Technical term for VAT, sales made within the EU, they are dispatches there. And that, where it is to the VAT registered customer, will be zero rated. As it would have been if we'd made any sales to any non-EU customers. Whether they were businesses, whether they were individuals, wouldn't have made a difference. They would all have been zero rated. So very simple. When we're making export sales to, uh, again, outside of the EU, it doesn't matter whether or not it's to a business or an individual, they're all zero rated. But the one exception to the zero rating of sales made to overseas customers is where we have an export or indeed dispatch now, of course, of £10,000 of goods to the non that registered individual, non that registered individual in Latvia. Well, we now need to have VAT equal to 20% of 10,000, it was a VAT exclusive figure, £2,000 accounted for by the business, BW Limited, on its VAT return for this period. And that, of course, would be the quarter to the 31st of March 2021 there. And that would be shown as output VAT. So we need to charge at our normal rate for that sale. We would presume here it would have been a standard rated sale. So very simple in terms of sales made, sales made outside of the EU to whomsoever the customer may be, I repeat, will all be zero rated. Sales within the EU to a VAT registered business, a fellow VAT registered business, then that too will be zero rated. But if we're selling to an individual there, then we must account, or a non-VAT registered business indeed, we must account for output VAT at what would be our normal rate for that sale, 
presumably a standard rate, and that means VAT output that here at 20% is to be accounted for. More interesting are the imports or acquisitions, as the case may be. Now here we've got the import of £12,000 of goods from a non-EU supplier. Now if we buy in from a non-EU supplier, this was the USA uh, business here, then we are going to have to pay VAT at the point of entry in relation to that purchase. If we had been buying those goods from a UK supplier for £12,000 exclusive of VAT, what would we have to have done? We would have had to have paid out to the supplier within the UK, not 12,000, but 12,000 plus 20% VAT. We'd have been invoiced by that UK supplier. The 12,000 plus 20% is what, 2,400 pounds, 14,400. So we'd have paid out 14,400 to the supplier and the UK supplier would then have had to account for the output VAT thereon. We would then have our purchase of 14,400 from another UK supplier. Our net cost was 12,000 and we would recover as input VAT the 2,000 pounds, sorry, 2,400 pounds of VAT on that purchase. If we buy in as we have done from the American company, they invoice us for 12,000 pounds. We pay them £12,000. Now that would mean we could buy in from overseas at 12000 and if we bought from the UK we'd initially have to pay 14.4 before recovering the input VAT. So it doesn't work that way. So what happens is on that purchase in order to get our hands on the American goods that we bought at the point of entry we have to pay the VAT and that therefore would be £2,400 being paid to HRMRC at the point of entry, assuming, as we said, that the duty deferment scheme is not in place that would allow those goods to be taken without the immediate payment at the port of entry. point of entry. This can be recovered as input VAT on the VAT return, just like then as if it had been a purchase from a UK supplier. There we would have paid the UK supplier the whole 14.4, they would have accounted for the VAT on the sale to us. We buy in from America, we pay the American supplier £12,000, we then have to pay the 2400 VAT directly to HMRC. But that then shows as input VAT on our VAT return to be, of course, then set off against any output VAT on our sales. The more awkward one is where we buy in from an EU supplier. The import or acquisition, as it would now be, of £20,000 of goods from the EU supplier will involve this so-called self-supply and the use of what is referred to as the reverse charge system. A self-supply of output VAT of £20,000 at 20%, £4,000. pounds, Being accounted for by BW Limited, on its VAT return for this period, again the VAT return the quarter is to 31st of March 21, but as well as showing it as output VAT, however assuming B limit, sorry, they're not BW limited, makes wholly taxable supplies, which they will in any question you see, the same amount of £4,000 can be recovered as input VAT. So there we go in relation to the £4,000. Uh, it's accounted for there. We involve a self-supply. We've got output VAT, self-supply of acquisition from EU supplier, £4,000. It can also be recovered at input VAT on the self-supply of acquisition from the EU supplier. So 4000 cancels out. But we have to, that we can't, we must not just ignore it. The net effect here is zero. And in 99% of cases will be zero. But as I've said to you, but you do not need to know, the reason why we have to do it this way is if we eventually made exempt supplies, then that means that any input tax that we have suffered in relation to those exempt supplies, we are unable to recover. So in order, therefore, to make sure that HMRC don't lose out on any VAT amounts, they therefore have this system. 
you have to account for what is taken as output VAT and as long as you make taxable supplies you can then recover the self same figure as input VAT and you're back to square one. Okay that means that there is only one other thing left for us to now consider which in certain circumstances in practice and especially as so much is electronic these days can be a problem but it's not a problem so far as our syllabus is concerned. That is the supply of services. And here it doesn't matter whether our customer is inside or outside of the EU. We have a simple system to begin with whereby if we supply our services to an overseas customer, to an overseas business customer, we are talking here outside the scope of VAT and to an overseas non-business customer it's standard rated. Whether that customer is in the EU or not in the EU doesn't matter. All that matters is where they are. Overseas business customer outside scope of VAT, overseas non-business customer standard rated. Sorry did I say where they are? All that matters is who they are there. Who is the customer? Is it business? Is it non-business? I repeat, as you see there, if it's business customer, it's outside scope of VAT. If it's a non-business customer, whether inside or outside the EU that we are supplying to, it is a standard rated supply. We must account within the UK for output VAT on that supply. If we are consuming a service, supplied by an overseas business, we get a service from an overseas business, then again, irrespective of whether the supplier of that service is themselves based within the EU or outside, we have to do what we did just a few minutes ago in terms of purchases from an EU, that registered supplier, and that was the self-supply stroke reverse charge system applying as we have just seen. So we have to account for what is output VAT in relation to the supply of the service to us. That's the output that, that would have been charged by a UK provider of those services. We have to put that as output VAT in relation to this particular supply. But assuming that what we make is in turn taxable supplies, we'll be able to recover it as input VAT. So it's exactly the same as we've just seen in relation to the purchase of those goods from the EU supplier there, the VAT registered supplier. It is exactly the same. So to repeat therefore, um, in relation to the supply of services, it doesn't matter where the customer is, what matters is are they business or are they non-business customers? If they are business customers, it's outside scope. If they're non-business customers, then it is standard rated. If that supply, which it would have been, would otherwise have been standard rated. When we are provided with a service as a UK business from an overseas supplier, again, irrespective of whether that supplier is based inside or outside the EU, we go down the self-supply stroke reverse charge system. We have to account for what would have been the VAT charge had that been supplied by a UK supplier and then treat that as output VAT, but also the fact that we've now incurred that as a cost allows us to recover it as input VAT. Assuming that is that eventually, in relation to what we do as a UK business, that we make taxable supplies then we can recover it as input VAT. Okay, that therefore uh, concludes the uh, chapter here on VAT and is of course the conclusion of all of our technical chapters. Uh, again, as ever, following those technical chapters and before you move on to the uh, missing pieces of things we haven't already covered from within chapter 26, there is of course the usual reading, review, practice that needs to be done please ensure that you do that.